Every year we run a public lecture series. The lectures are, are intended to bring uh, leading international thinkers and practitioners on planning and the built environment before an audience of colleagues, uh, students and guests. If you haven't uh, already uh, acquainted yourself with our website, please do, where uh, you'll see details of the program. So far this year we've welcomed Rachel Weber from the University of Illinois, who spoke about uh, commercial real estate bubbles in Chicago, Nicole Duran from Sydney University, who spoke about affordable housing, and Alex Schwartz from the New School in New York City, who spoke about the planning and housing policies of Mayor Bill de Blasio. Uh, the series culminates in May with the Sir Peter Hall annual lecture, which this year will be given by Professor John Forrester of Cornell University. So look out for the details of that lecture uh, and sign up for notifications of, of, of future lectures. Uh, as with all of our lectures, uh, we invite you afterwards to join us outside for, for drinks, a uh, small reception. If, uh, please do join us um, and uh, continue the discussion in a convivial environment. Um, so after our uh, tour of global <coughs> cities and their planning challenges, tonight we've brought the discussion a bit closer to home. Uh, as many of you will know, this year is the 50th anniversary of the founding of Milton Keynes, perhaps the most prominent of the post-war new towns developed in the UK. Uh, it's an anniversary which has been attended by uh, some significant media attention, some interesting articles in papers like the Financial Times, The Economist and so on. Um, it's worth noting that the Bartlett has a, a long relationship with Milton Keynes. Richard Llewellyn Davies, Lord Llewellyn Davies, uh, who served here both as Professor of Architecture and Professor of Planning, was also the founder of Llewellyn Davies Weeks, which uh, a consultancy which uh, designed, or co-designed anyway, Milton Keynes. According to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, uh, the, the entry on, um, uh, on Llewellyn Davies, it says the first significant scheme in the mid-1960s was for Washington Newtown, in the northeast of England, but the major achievement was undoubtedly the major achievement of um, the New Town era was undoubtedly the layout for Milton Keynes, the last of the post-war New Towns built from 1972 onwards. Um, so, Llewellyn Davies developed the, uh, the plan for Milton Keynes, which was published in 1970. Uh, according to the OMDB, it represented the importation of the car-based dispersed American city typified by Los Angeles. That's not often Los Angeles and Milton Keynes are mentioned in the same breath. However, it was also given the crucial British improvements, at least in theory, of mixed tenure housing, tight social regulation, and a public transport system. Milton Keynes exemplified the one and Davies design approach. The master plan was deliberately open ended, flexible, and repetitious, and consequently lacked any clear aesthetic vision. Um, so, there you go. Um, so we had a role uh, in the Bartlett in the very origins of this, uh, of this important settlement. Um, so it seems especially appropriate that we should give consideration to the Milton Keynes story in this anniversary year. And Anna and I met earlier with one of our esteemed colleagues, Michael Edwards, uh, who I think is the last member of the Bartlett faculty who actually participated in the work that contributed to the original design of, of Milton Keynes. <coughs> Uh, he can't be here with us tonight, but we've had an interesting discussion with him about it all. So tonight's speaker is exceptionally well qualified to lead the task of considering the Milton Keynes story. Anna Rose is a planner, she holds a first degree and master's degree in town and country planning, and has been an RTPI member since 2003. She started her planning career advising NFU members on planning law before moving to Rugby Borough Council, uh, where, she was, uh, where she led the preparation of the local development framework. Anna became Head of Planning and Culture at Rugby in 2007, taking on responsibility for economic development, sports and arts as well as planning. She led the planning team through a successful review of the planning service and prioritised the promotion of economic growth. In November 2014, Anna moved to her present position at Milton Keynes Council where she currently serves as Director of Growth, Economy and Culture. And alongside a program of service improvement, she is currently leading the authority in producing the next 50-year spatial vision for the area. Anna is also president of the UK Planning Officers Society, 
an active peer reviewer for PAS, and a regular speaker on strategic planning issues, growth focused planning, and improving planning performance. So, I think, as I said, exceptionally well qualified to take us through the, uh, the Milton Keynes story. So all that remains for me to do now is to uh, welcome Anna to UCL and to the Bartlett and to say, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you for coming this evening. That all sounded very grand. Um, I do know a lot about planning. I haven't been at Milton Keynes long. What you will get this evening is very much the Anna Rose view. I always say this, and there's a few in the audience who've heard it before, but I tend not to take on the, the signature of either my employer or the planning officer society, just in case I accidentally stray into something that's just my own opinion. So if you can just take it as that, that would be welcome. So it's not all about concrete cows and roundabouts. I'm going to try and inspire you about Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes has a certain image, it's not always good, it has a reputation, that's not always good. But those of us who are passionate about it are really, really passionate about it. And I'm here to convince you, if you think anything else, that it's a wonderful place and that it can be even better. So, what am I going to talk about? I think that the first thing I'm going to do is look back at how it all started. It has a lot of familiar themes to what we're seeing at governmental level at the moment. And I think it's interesting to see how Milton Keynes came about and look at where we are currently in terms of governmental policy. I think whenever you're looking at how an urban area or a space has changed, you need to look at the governance and what was in place at the time that made those changes or made those certain developments happen. We look at the tariff. The tariff is internationally interesting. It is something that we have all sorts of visitors to Milton Keynes come to talk to us about. It's novel, it worked, and I would like to talk you through why we can't do it again today in the present time. And then a bit about the future. Probably the bit that I'm most interested in is what we do next. Can the next 50 years be as exciting as the previous? Can we do something within the current planning system? And if we can, what would it be? So when I looked at the origins of Milton Keynes, and I was saying um, earlier that I studied this at Geography A level. It was a case study for me. And the things I remember are 130 roundabouts. I remember that clearly. I still remember that at my interview for this job. Um, and, and probably very little else, actually. The 130 roundabouts was the bit that really stuck from the age of 18. But I think what's significant here is that the idea for a new settlement in Buckinghamshire came from a planning officer, came from a local government planning officer named Fred Pooley, who thought that by having a new settlement, we could preserve the green belt. For those of you who follow planning on Twitter, LinkedIn, you will know this is very relevant today. And actually, the housing white paper has brought in new you know, suggested new legislation that would mean that we could have um, development corporations again, which suggests that we could go to new towns again. And I wonder if in their thinking somewhere is that we could prevent, protect the green belt. It was also the evidence that came out of a regional study that led to the, everybody looking at new towns. So again, the familiarity with the current day where we've got abolished regional plans, but actually we've gone back in some way in the housing white paper to strategic plans <coughs> over a wider area. And maybe they would look at what the population forecasts were um, for an area, and maybe they would come to the same conclusion that the only way to deal with a natural increase and also maybe Londoners needing to move out because there's no room, which was exactly the case in the South East re Regional Study, that maybe the only answer would be new towns. The New Towns <coughs> Act of 1965 created that legislative framework that aided both Fred Pooley's idea, but also the Regional Study's evidence. And so, it all started there. And in 1967, the Minister of Housing and Local Government at the time designated a site of almost 9,000 hectares for the development of Milton Keynes, and at the same time established 
the development corporation that would be responsible for the work of, on that new town. So the new town was originally built to accommodate the incoming population of about 150,000 Londoners. So similar to where we are now with an unknown housing requirement for the London area and a need to look beyond the London boundaries for somewhere to house it. And so together with that 150,000 and the natural increase in population, Milton Keynes would eventually house 250,000 people. So the designated area included the then existing towns of Bletchley, Stony Stratford, Wolverton and New Bradwell. And in fact, Milton Keynes was never meant to be Milton Keynes. It was going to be Bletchley. But it was named Milton Keynes after Milton Keynes Village, which at the time was but a hamlet within the overall designated area, together with 13 partner villages <coughs> and the brick fields to the southwest of Bletchley. So those 9,000 hectares were, as you can see on this plan, really quite undeveloped. Bletchley was the biggest settlement, and this would grow to fill its boundaries. I think that with the Development Corporation, so this is a government agency which was established to plan and implement development, and quite crucially for us in the room when we're talking about planning, had special planning powers, which meant that it could dodge the electoral cycle that planning at the moment suffers from. And so I think in terms of when we look at today and what that means in terms of development corporations, we're struggling to get the growth that we need in the country for housing. And in the housing white paper, certainly locally, local development corporations are being looked at once more as a way of delivering them. The Development Corporation for Milton Keynes used powers in the New Towns Act so that they could purchase all the land they needed. And if necessary, they would do that through compulsory purchase orders, and they would do that at the existing land value, which is the agricultural value in this case. Um, as the development took place, all the growth in land values brought about by infrastructure, planning permissions, landscaping, would be returned to the government. So you may have heard about land value capture, that is very much as something that the we, various organisations are trying to push the government to look to again, is that is very much the case, is that you would you have funding up front that would gear up the development that then would return its payment once the infrastructure was in place and the development. This plan that you see is critical to, I think, one of the most significant features of Milton Keynes. Most people would say it was a grid structure. I am actually really taken by the amount of green space that is available <coughs> in Milton Keynes. I would challenge the room to find anywhere within this island where there is as much open space per development unit as there is in Milton Keynes. It's very low density, and intentionally so. The idea was that people would live as communities, but would have the communal space around them that serves the purposes of providing the quality of life that people desired. This, as we know, is the grid system. Most people will recognise that. That's very um, recognisable as Milton Keynes. It's a one kilometre grid square. And whilst it could have been built on a very much graph paper basis, in that it would be absolutely straight, it was decided that actually it was much better to have the undulation that would lend itself to a feature of the countryside rather than necessarily an urban form. This has lent itself very well to the way in which Milton Keynes has developed because all the grid squares are designed individually. And so they can have the character either of an uh, urban area or of a village. And they sit next to each other, and that works really well. If you visit, you will see that you can move from one grid square to the other, and you will see recognisable differences in the way that they've been planned and designed. So the grid roads and the drainage were built in advance of any development taking place. This shows a commitment to the project, so the development, 
And if I take you to a scenario of today's planning, that would be that all your roads <coughs> and your drainage would be in, in place before the houses arrived. Any of us who drive around new housing estates now will recognise that you're usually dri driving over raised drains, your roads aren't made, and the, you know, we have little of that confidence that sometimes that's going to be done before the residents move in. So the planning system today doesn't lend itself to the same sort of certainty that Milton Keynes could put in place in terms of providing the infrastructure that communities desire up front before even a single brick is laid on a house. But in terms of it wasn't all about certainty, if you're going to put the roads and drainage in, obviously you're using a substantial slug of money. And at this point, that money was the government's. And as we all know, governments change their mind. They even change their faces quite regularly. And so if we spend the, the money on the grid roads and drainage, at least we've got it while the feeling's still good and the money's still there. And so you'll find that if you look at Milton Keynes, the, the grid roads and the drainage are all in and that's banked. That's something we were always going to take away. Um, and I think that's probably a principle that we might be looking to if we, if we ever got any money out of government again. Um, so this is the 1970 master plan. This is probably the plan that is most recognisable um, from a Milton Keynes planning perspective. It shows the very distinctive use planning that went into grid squares. And so the Development Corporation team were really clear that M Milton Keynes was to be properly planned and publicly owned. And so rather than being driven by volume house builders, as is the case in planning around the country today, there would be, it would be open to all. There would be local public sector building. There would be an equal amount of social to private. And, and the, it would be open to everybody. So even though those 150,000 people from London were earmarked in the original plans for Milton Keynes, actually the Development Corporation team would like it that we weren't reliant on that, that local authority nominations in terms of housing provision and overspill settlements should be ignored, actually, because this should be a place where people want to move to rather than they were forced or chosen. And it's worked. Milton Keynes is full of people who were really passionate about Milton Keynes because they wanted to move there. And so I will come back to this later in the presentation, but you will note that there are six key principles attached to the Milton Keynes Master Plan. They're all simple, but they have guided the development of Milton Keynes for 50 years. And they are still considered when we look at our plan today, because they're seen as being the best principles for the development of Milton Keynes. And to think that you could write six principles back in 1970 that still everybody feels they couldn't come up with anything better today, I think that's quite something, actually. And it will be a theme throughout when I talk about the later stages of development. So the change of government, I think, and governance of Milton Keynes. The change of governance has a distinct impact on how Milton Keynes has developed. And so Milton Keynes was designated a new town, obviously, in 1967. And the plan for Milton Keynes, as we saw, 1970. And everything went rather well from that point. So we had the infrastructure, we had the grid roads, the drainage system. And then a new government came in. So around 1978, we started to see a change. The governmental policy had started to move away from those green areas moving away from developing new towns and back into the regeneration of older urban areas. Again, I recall some of my education and looking at some of those regenerations, particularly around Manchester, when the governmental policy changed and we were focusing on high-density urban development rather than low-density green development. So 1978, I think you could pinpoint that era as being that significant change. 
the Development Corporation at that point were able to change the em emphasis on, on building private rather than council housing. There was a need to move with the times. There was a need to still have the favour of government. And there was a need, really, to try and hang on to as much of the funding as possible. And so we saw also a move to home ownership more than rental. And so that's a big change of the time in that um, if you watch the news, if you focus on housing policy, you will see that changing government makes a considerable difference to how we view tenure. And so at the moment, we've gone from a government who were very pro-home ownership, and we seem to be edging back slightly to consider rental again. And so that was exactly the same it, back when the development corporation were in operation. The winds of change in terms of, of how governmental policy changes how we operate in planning. So it's clear that the Newtown's model of the 60s and 70s was being left somewhat in the distance, particularly in terms of the finance that was available to, to develop out the work of the master plan. The new town model now had to become a slim, self-financing property investment vehicle. And so the development corporation had a different role in terms of Milton Keynes. And some of the, the pictures I will show you later will show how the developments changed in terms of what was being developed out. And you can see it in the texture of Milton Keynes now, what has been developed at what points. And it's quite a nice way of seeing the texture of the different eras of development and what financing and governance was in place at, the same, at, at that time. So the next big event was really, of course, when the Development Corporation was abolished. So in 1992, the Development Corporation was abolished and replaced by the Commission for New Towns. And then, but a few years later, the Commission for Newtown merged with English Partnerships. And then, in 2004, that, that merged into Milton Keynes Partnership. And that's probably when we start to see the next big shift in terms of how Milton Keynes operates. Milton Keynes then had Milton Keynes Council as the planning authority or the plan making authority, and Milton Keynes Partnership as the delivery vehicle. Working together, Milton Keynes Partnership and the local authority drew up a plan that designated 15,000 homes as east and west expansions to the urban, the urban area that had been designated as a new town. So we see our first expansion of that designated area. And the assets and planning consents um, are now with English partnerships through Milton Keynes, part, um, Milton Keynes Partnership. So this takes you through the, the growth that Milton Keynes has experienced through those areas. And so as a planned new town since 1967, Milton Keynes has grown from that picture at the beginning of some 9,000 hectares of largely open countryside and villages. It, and it's now home to around 270,000 residents in over 100,000 homes, with the population continuing to rise at quite a substantial rate. There are 140,000 jobs across the borough. We're a major business attractor. Um, and the businesses are attracted by our location because we're right on the motorway, we're within half an hour of London, everything's going for us in terms of Milton Keynes, but probably the big thing for Milton Keynes is the amount of land still available for development. There is still a substantial amount of land around Milton Keynes compared to other urban areas, and that is attractive to the development sector. So 19 million people live within a 90-minute drive of the city, making it easily accessible for visitors, but also what attracts people to Milton Keynes now, I go back to the point I made about the green and open spaces. Milton Keynes has more leisure visitors, probably, than it does for people coming to work. So people make use of our cycling, of our lakes, 
of the ability to bring families and entertain them because what we have that other urban areas don't have is a vast array of leisure opportunities and that's because they were designed in right from the very beginning. Um, many places are trying to retrofit green and open spaces, parks, into an existing built-up area and actually that is never going to work quite as well as when the, the premise of urban planning has been based around linear parks that create a drainage system that can also be used by the community for their own leisure. I think that there's something very special. If you look at this growth programme on here, you will see that the green and blue features are very significant in terms of the urban plan, and they continue to be so. And so, um, whereas most plans, if you looked at them over this period, would show um, uh, increasing degradation of the green and blue space that's available in an urban area, in Milton Keynes, what you see is that it's been expanded and enhanced with each subsequent plan that's come in place. And so there, there is a model there about creating something in urban planning that lasts longer than the plan or the uh, electoral cycle that it sits in. Um, Milton Keynes has a Parks Trust, um, which is, um, manages all of the green assets in Milton Keynes. Um, so every time we plan a development, it, it goes to the Parks Trust to manage with a dowry so some money to, to, for its ongoing maintenance from the development sector. So when we look at what planning through the ages, I thought it would be interesting to take you through some of the developments. For those of you who haven't been to Milton Keynes, it's hard to describe the difference in architecture unless you see it. Um, it, it's so very different in terms of what you would see everywhere else. Um, these these um, buildings obviously were at the very early period of the development corporation in Bean Hill. And there, Bean Hill is one of our, what we call a donor estate. Um, they're the estates that surround the centre of Milton Keynes, like a, a ring donut. So that's what they're called. These estates are now in need of regeneration. Unfortunately, everything in Milton Keynes that was built at this era is now ageing at the same time. And so <laughs> what we have is um, a conflict, really, between retaining what is special about the architecture, because it is very significant in terms of its era, but also making that architecture fit for some of our most deprived communities. So there's, uh, there's, I can see some shaking of heads in the audience. Um, obviously, design is um, subjective. And so um, this, the, the thing with modern heritage and, um, is that you would not always recognise it as being special. But it is special because of, one, who the architect is, but also the time in which it was created. And so it references a point of time, a time in new towns that you might not appreciate because we are always looking further back than that. So Milton Keynes brings about um, another challenge, which is modern heritage. That's that's probably another lecture. But there's uh, that this is very these areas in the donut estates are very significant in terms of Milton Keynes because they tell a story. Um, there's I have been told that no architect was allowed to design more than 70 units. Um, and so you will see that um, the, their groupings of homes and then there will be a distinct change in the design of them as you move round, which actually is very interesting in itself. So this is another of um, the earlier estates in Connerborough, again one of the donut estates. I'm just going to flick through these just so because I think it tells, it tells the story in itself. So now we're starting to move. And what you will notice is that these look much more like everywhere else. Yes? So uh, Milton Keynes has started to get into the volume house building industry. Um, these look very much like you might see in any city or town. Similar. CMK is, um, is probably more distinct from the areas that aren't built than it is for the buildings in some respects. The space in central Milton Keynes is something that you cannot appreciate until you work, walk it as a pedestrian. 
Um, if you walk from the station in Milton Keynes up to where I work in the council offices, you, the space in between the building that you're walking next to and the next one over the road is something that if you compared it to London, you would, you would be several streets down. You know, there is a huge, there's like a motorway in between yourself and the next building. And so the space, the boulevards um, and the grid system create is something quite spectacular. And the low level of the buildings makes the space seem even greater. And so this, this shows that this is actually quite a high building for central Milton Keynes. Um, we don't have many high buildings in Milton Keynes, really. A few more now, but certainly in compared to other cities, we have relatively few. So this is Monkston. Again, we're now looking at um, what I would call the high-density era of planning. So we're getting more into um, the... Still a bit more distinct than the rest of the country in terms of design this compared to the previous. Um, but we're getting into an era where um, it was all about putting the houses in rather than putting all the other bits and bobs and space in. Um, you will see around the country, and I have a particular view on this and I don't apologise for it, that we created a disaster in terms of urban design because what we were doing was putting far too many houses into an area um, at the expense of um, the ability to park, certainly. <laughs> Bins is usually a problem. If you go and look at sites that have been developed in this sort of era, you will see that there's, in the 2000s, all the way through, there is just a sign that actually things were a little bit lopsided in terms of how we were developing them out. Um, this is rather nice, though. I'm trying to show you a collection. I think this is a, this is a shows off that real one of those really good features of Milton Keynes, which is our water. You know, the fact that we've got so much water dedicated to both a purpose but also a public realm um, is really quite special. And you, you, you realise it when you plan, as I do, for Milton Keynes, just how that creates something that you could never manufacture again. And then here we go again, just Grange Farm, late 2000s. And then this is uh, Milton Keynes that you will recognise. This is the centre of Milton Keynes. It's very distinct. Um, you wouldn't miss it. There's, uh, and it's still very, very green. So Campbell Park, which sits alongside the centre, uh, the built-up area of centre Milton, Milton Keynes, is really distinct. It creates a really nice frame for the, the retail and business district. And you see there that there's, it's got more trees than you would expect anywhere else. It has more space dedicated to the public, but it also is very low density. So in terms of a centre, that is somewhere that, that is extremely low density compared to, to most other cities or towns of a similar size. So... What have we done in terms of planning in Milton Keynes since the Development Corporation, since Milton Keynes Partnership, since English Partnership? Well, the last local plan, so back when we were with Milton Keynes Partnership, looked to build on the original strategic plan for the city. So we still would like to have the space um, and those six principles. Um, but if I go back, actually, and talk about the years... If you look at um, 2010 and after that, you will see that the urban area of Milton Keynes has grown ears. And so those are the eastern and western expansion areas. Those are the 15,000 homes that Milton Keynes Partnership and the Council designated for the next growth area in Milton Keynes. And instead of being based on a grid system, these would be the first areas of Milton Keynes that would look at city streets. And so... They were designed to have good access to high-quality bus routes, bearing in mind that Milton Keynes' model is very much around mobility and connectivity, but mainly for the car. These were the first areas where there was an attempt to make them suitable for public transport specifically. And it was a, these areas were a direct response to meeting the housing needs in the area at the time, 
Um, and by having denser housing, you create the demand for public transport. So the east and western expansion areas that you see there were very much geared up to trying to support a public transport system. When we got to the core strategy, um, we then allocated another strategic site, except in this case, we decided that we would put the grid road um, stubs back in so that if at any time in the future there was money available, we would recreate the grid road system. And so I think that you can see from that that actually the city streets in the east and western expansion areas, although quite popular with some of the people who live there, have not been popular with the general population of Milton Keynes. I have, since I've been there, so two and a half years now, I've probably had the most public meetings about city streets than I have about almost anything else. And they, they really are seen as stepping completely away from the Milton Keynes model. So these streets are seen as being um, rat runs through residential areas, which grid roads are completely separated from. If you look at a grid road structure, the development faces away from it. You often can't see the development from the road when you're on a grid road, whereas the city street is much like we would think of in any other town or city, where the building space onto it, you're going <coughs> through a road where people would be walking alongside you. You would have pedestrian crossings. In grid roads, we have underpasses, and people aren't expected to cross over them because actually the grid roads are meant for speed, and people travel on them at you know, 60 miles an hour. So you don't want people crossing them. <coughs> Um, the other more controversial plans have been considered for Milton Keynes over the years and are still being considered um, and these are generally in response to regional plans and they've involved going over into our neighbours land and so Ellsbury Vale and Central Beds particularly um, you know there is a view that Milton Keynes should grow and the urban area should grow but in, in order to do that in any significant way we would have to grow into somebody else's land um, and that's seen up until recently as not being the right thing to do and certainly not popular with the voters immediately on our border, um, it appears. And so those, um, those plans to go over the borders have soon been rejected in favour of filling up our own boundaries first because it comes under the category of a little bit too difficult. Um, we will be looking at redeveloping those donut estates. We have a regeneration programme which looks at how we can um, improve the lives of the people living in them, but also preserving some, some of what's special about them. And that is no mean feat. So what we're attempting to do is work with the communities, often through the means of neighbourhood plans, so that the communities can be involved in designing what they would like to see in the future rather than the council imposing something on them. And that's something that we do across Milton Keynes. We're really, really good at neighbourhood plans. We have a substantial amount of neighbourhood plans and we are award-winning neighbourhood plan, Newport Pagnell, um, takes up 40% of the whole housing al allocation for the rural area in Milton Keynes. Um, and they did that so that they could get a school and a community centre. They realised that if they wanted to get the facilities for their community, that they were going to have to have a quantum of development that was over and above what they required. And I think that shows the um, strategic thinking that some of our communities in Milton Keynes have because they live around Milton Keynes. There is a different thought process when it comes to development. Got to go back to the. Sorry. So these are some of our big businesses that we have. So we have Red Bull as our F1 team. Red Bull are really supportive of the of Milton Keynes as a place. Um, we have a lot of events with Red Bull. They are seen very much um, as the Milton Keynes business. They promote Milton Keynes wherever they can, um, and and that's good for us because it puts Milton Keynes on the map. Another significant move for us was when Network Rail moved their headquarters to Milton Keynes. And so they moved to the centre of Milton Keynes and brought all their staff with them right next to the rail station. And that was, that was a significant move in terms of headquarters for Milton Keynes. And we continue to grow in our business sector. 
I'm moving on now to the tariff. I think that the tariff, which came about through the Milton Keynes partnership and those 15,000 homes in the years on the east and west, so that's the area we're looking at. We're looking at 2005. Um, the government approved um, our Milton Keynes tariff approach to development. And so they realised that we needed growth and they realised that we needed a way of funding the infrastructure to go with that growth because the premise of Milton Keynes is infrastructure before expansion. So I before E, very much so. And so the approval that the government gave us allowed English partnerships to act as a banker for Milton Keynes by providing the advance funding that we would be required to ensure that some of those essential physical and social infrastructure required for the eastern ex and western expansion areas was in place at the right time. So at the right time means before the development. So the Milton Keynes tariff enables, um, it was established with Milton Keynes Council by Milton Keynes Partnership, which is um, who were born out of English <coughs> partnerships. It gets very complicated, even for me. Um, and so Milton Keynes Partnership were the plan making authority at that time. So, sorry, Milton Keynes Council were the plan making authority and Milton Keynes Partnership were the delivery vehicle. And together they developed a mechanism for capturing a proportion of the uplift in the land value. And so this comes back to that original principle of that land value capture. It doesn't work in quite the same way because the government isn't funding anything, really. There's a loan. Um, so the English partnerships in the tariff would fund the infrastructure and then the developers would phase their payments in the basis of a tariff which worked out for residential about 18,500 at the beginning and they would phase that so that they paid the majority of that once they had sold their properties in simple terms. The next slide goes into the phasing programme in a bit more detail. In order to do this, there had to be a growth prospectus um, for Milton Keynes that described all of those infrastructure items that would need to be covered by such a tariff and what facilities might be required to support the expansion areas up to 2016. Now, in Milton Keynes, we're not like everybody else because we don't have that historic infrastructure. So some of the things that other cities have, we would still be looking for. So some of those in historic terms might have been, um, you know, expansions to the hospital, a university, a, a gallery, a theatre, some of those things which we do have now, but we wouldn't have always had them as, as in the historic provision that you might see everywhere else. And therefore, our infrastructure list wasn't the standard that you might see everywhere else. It wasn't just roads, schools, um, health services, you know, the things that you would see in a list in most places. We had more ambition in terms of what we wanted to cover by the tariff. So we secure, so Milton Keynes Partnership secured a commitment from all the landowners and developers. So it was based on an agreement. We couldn't enforce this on our landowners and developers. We had to, as the Milton Keynes Partnership had to have an agreement with the landowners and developers um, within the expansion areas to a tariff-based Section 106 contribution. So basically the tariff system is the biggest pooling of Section 106 that you will see. It is a huge Section 106 agreement of about 310 million. And so the Milton Keynes Partnership acts as the banker, um, whilst the developers' contributions of 18,500 per residential dwelling and 260,000 per hectare of employment space would be pooled and used to reimburse English partnerships in future years after much of that infrastructure had been provided. There is a framework, Section 106 agreement in there, which is the main legal agreement um, between Milton Keynes Partnership and all of the principal landowners and developers. That is the contractual agreement that the tariff sits under. Um, and as with all funding systems in terms of planning obligations, developers' contributions don't cover all of the costs of growth. Um, you know, there's no system Still, Section 106, anything, covers the whole cost of growth to a local area. But 
the council and the landowners and developers were prepared to enter into this agreement because of the certainty that a tariff framework offers. If you know up front that you will get the infrastructure provided for your development, that you will have to fund 75% of the local infrastructure, but that you can do that when you've actually made the money on the development, then there is a certainty for the council that the development is going to be delivered. There is a certainty for the community that the infrastructure is going to be there. And there is a certainty for Milton Keynes Partnership and English Partnerships that they're going to get some of their money back. So, this is how it worked in the beginning, is that for residential, the developer or landowner would pay 10% on the grant of permission. 15% before they started on site, and then the, the, the majority of it would be quarterly after the first completion. Um, and so the payment, as it says there, is relative to the proportion of dwellings that were sold or rented. And so commercial is a similar principle in terms of how it operated. But it, as I said, it's the certainty, the cash flow and the managing of public opinion that creates a win-win-win in terms of the tariff. What we have, what the biggest, if you see the placards around the country, if you go outside of London, um, you know, there's placards about development almost everywhere that has a green space at the moment. And most of them say an extra 4,000 cars on our roads. <coughs> to our schools are going to be too full. We can't get to see a GP. All of those things are answered if you get your infrastructure first. Because actually what you've done is you've created a flow in terms of the existing population um, so that they are not negatively affected by the impact of the additional growth. At the moment, the way that we usually work is that we allow for a certain level of residential development to take place, which would then create the funding for the infrastructure to go in after it. If you've already got some 300 houses being lived in, then they are having an impact on the existing infrastructure and thereby impacting on the, on the existing population who are therefore not happy about the growth taking place. I believe very strongly that if we could um, bring back some sort of land value capture or a new sort of tariff, that we could start to gain the public's confidence again in how development is delivered and thereby we wouldn't have the placards and the legal issues that we have at the moment towards development. So why wouldn't it work today? Well, Milton Keynes Council, amongst probably a half of the country, has decided not to do community infrastructure levy because it's, um, quite frankly, a bad idea. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't pay for the infrastructure. It doesn't allow for the payment of infrastructure up front. So you can't borrow against it. So you can't borrow against a future return with community infrastructure levy. So when we calculated it in Milton Keynes, from 2015, when we were first expected to bring in a community infrastructure levy. We identified, as with most councils, that we would have an overall funding gap of about 420 million between the identified funding sources, including our forecast of new homes bonus and planning obligation income, and the cost of providing all the identified infrastructure. That's probably standard practice. It looks a lot but most people would have a gap of about that much. By moving to a community infrastructure levy, we estimated that we would be increasing or exacerbating that funding gap by as much as 80 million, as a direct result of having to revise downwards our receipts. We also can borrow against the future community infrastructure levy receipts um, because that, currently, that power currently rests with the Secretary of State. And so the council wouldn't be able to borrow against it. We would have to apply to the Secretary of State. And so therefore, we lose our ability to forward fund our infrastructure, as we have been doing right back since you know, the 1970s. So by bringing in community infrastructure levy, we, we, lost, we would lose that ability to forward fund our infrastructure. And that significantly 
affect our future allocation of sites. And so I come back to the placards in the countryside there. In Milton Keynes, it is felt more rawly probably than anywhere else in terms of what future development means without that forward funding of the infrastructure. Because Milton Keynes knows how it should work and actually trying to convince a population who have seen it work that, it would, that we could do the east and western expansion areas again. Actually, the east and western expansion areas were not well received by a lot of the public because they didn't put all the infrastructure in that the public would have liked. They certainly didn't put the right <coughs> infrastructure in, so the grid roads. And actually, we're up against it now as a council in terms of com compelling our public to support um, an aspirational level of growth because they are nervous that they're going to face the same problems that everywhere else in the country are. So the current pooling restriction on Section 106 agreements prevents us from having a tariff at the moment. So our ability to sign developers up to a tariff ceased in April 2015, which means everybody else in Milton Keynes who wants to develop is on an individually negotiated Section 106 agreement, which means that we are at the whim of developers to say that they can't afford it that they certainly can't afford the affordable housing, and that we are in a situation of bartering. With a tariff, you don't barter, it's all set out at the beginning. The tariff as well it is very flexible. And so, whereas the community infrastructure levy, you can't um, phase the payments, the payment has to come at the beginning. Um, with a tariff, of course, we could be flexible. We could take in kind. So if the developer wanted to put the road in or the school, we could offset that against what they might pay at a later date. It's very flexible in terms of delivering development across a wide area because it is an agreement with the development industry. It's based on a rate that is index linked. And um, it also has that ability to um, encourage the public to have a confidence in that you're going to deliver what you say you are going to. And I think we've lost that with the current community infrastructure levy. So what next? I think this is probably the most exciting thing that I've seen in terms of some of the ventures around the country in terms of future gazing. And so many places have tried it, but because Milton Keynes has done it so successfully before, there was a real appetite when the council commissioned a group of local people and independent experts to have a look at what the next 50 years might look like for Milton Keynes. <laughs> and actually the engagement, we had everybody from youth assemblies to schools to ex-development corporation people to um, the rural areas, and the rural areas in Milton Keynes don't generally get involved in anything that's happening in the urban area, so they're, they're like two distinct groups. Everybody was really interested in what this could mean for Milton Keynes, and that they could have a role in looking at what the future might look like. And so the Futures Commission looked at making a great city greater, and they looked at what the population could be, so we're looking at some 400,000 by 20. 2050, if you think we're at 270,000 now, so by 2050 we'd be at some 400,000. They recommended six big projects that we would do. So six is familiar to Milton Keynes. We have six guiding principles for development in 1970. We have six big projects for the next 50 years. And unusually, the Commission's report was unanim unanimously supported by full council. Anybody who knows about the politics of Milton Keynes will understand that. We have an even number of Labour and Conservative councillors, and the Labour administration have an alliance with the Liberal Democrats at the moment. It is not easy getting unanimous support in our council chamber, I can tell you that. So now we're working to deliver those projects through the programme. And so what are those projects, and how do they relate to how we grow in the future? Well, probably of the most significance nationally is the Cambridge-Milton-Keynes-Oxford corridor. This is not a new concept. 
I think I first learned about this at university myself, um, and it was called the Ark at that point, um, the Cambridge Oxford Ark. Um, and what it's looking at at the moment is how we join these economic powerhouses along an uh, east-west corridor, which at the moment is very difficult to travel easily between. And so it relies on some serious bits of infrastructure in terms of rail and road, but it also relates to the need for a wider spatial plan across uh, a wider area than just Milton Keynes. And so we're back to that point about sub-regional regional planning, about what is necessary. And this first project will need Milton Keynes to be bold and put a strategy in place, place for 2050. That's not a planning document. That is going to be a high-level strategic doc document about how that corridor, from a Milton Keynes perspective, can be delivered. And that's going to be really significant in terms of where we go next. The ambition has always been to have a new university for Milton Keynes. And there's, there's a space already emerging within the centre of Milton Keynes that would house a new university. We have the universities in the local area all working together to see if they can create a new and innovative um, offer that has not been seen in the area. Milton Keynes doesn't um, operate well in terms of education. We have very low attainment, actually, for the type of place we are, and that needs to be improved. This was recognised by the Vision Commission. They were very keen that every child should have the chance of a good education a Milton Keynes project, um, promise that we would give everybody the opportunity to be great. And that's what Learning 2050 is all about. It's trying to raise our educational attainment right from early years all the way through. Smart, shared, sustainable mobility. This is very much about answering the question of congestion before it really gets too bad. So we need to come up with something that still gives Milton Keynes that label of being connected and mobile doesn't take away people's ability to use the car, but actually provides something that people want to use instead of their car. It makes it easy to travel, not only from Milton Keynes to Milton Keynes, but also from Oxford, Cambridge, into Milton Keynes as well. We're an attractor, and we want to remain so, but we also want to build on our ability to innovate to deliver a new transport solution. We also recognise that our centre is starting to deteriorate in part. Our public realm is all of the same age and therefore with council funding reducing and the ability to, of the upkeep of what is very expensive um, materials at Milton Keynes, granite sets, curb stones, it's not easy and we need to do something about the centre of Milton Keynes before it starts to deteriorate even further and we lose our place in the market as, as that top retail and um, business headquarters location. But probably the thing that I think is most important for Milton Keynes is seizing the opportunity that is placed by the arts and culture movement in Milton Keynes. Nowhere else has got that same emphasis on people's leisure time and enjoyment in terms of their living environment, but also the things that the community are provided with to enjoy their non-work time, shall I put it that way. Milton Keynes has a really active art sector and we need to make sure that we harness this before all of the money runs out at a national level to support it. We need to strengthen the cultural sector and we need to all work together so that we can build on what is very special about Milton Keynes. So the other big thing that's happened for Milton Keynes that talks to the Cambridge Milton Keynes Oxford corridor is the National Infrastructure Commission who have recognised that Milton Keynes is very much at the centre of this, these two major projects that they've identified which is East West Rail and a new expressway. And so I thought it was interesting as a planner how people read this report, interim report, in two very different ways. And so all the transport planners read it as two very big roads, or rail, and all the planners saw it as housing growth. And actually it's a bit in the middle. 
It's, it's about saying that those two bits of transport infrastructure are necessary to enable the links, but actually in order to make the infrastructure worthwhile, we really have to deliver the housing that supports those economic areas. Unfortunately, at the moment, we, um, we are still in conversation with some of our neighbours and partners about what the interim report actually meant. So we're still going around a little bit of a cycle, but the, the, the premise is really that there is a huge opportunity here. Um, the interim report has obviously come out and the autumn statement has given money over to the delivery of those two bits of infrastructure. What we have to do as local authorities and as partners in the local area is jump on board and say, what could we do together to finally start looking beyond people's boundaries and build up that corridor? It's really important that we don't lose the will of the government at the moment. I take you back to the grid roads and the drainage system right at the beginning and catching it while there's money there and goodwill. I think this is one of those. We need to catch this while there's money there and there's still goodwill from the government. So what are we doing now? We have a local plan on Tuesday evening. Our local plan was agreed at Cabinet for consultation. And so we've had a few consultations. In Milton Keynes, we do consultation quite heavily. So um, we have been informed by comments from two earlier rounds of consultation and also the obvious evidence studies that we all have for plan making. And once adopted, our local plan will replace our core strategy from 2013 and our local plan from 2005. Yes, we are still using some policies from 2005. I own up to that. And so these are our existing commitments. The problem we have in Milton Keynes is that we have 19,725 homes permitted that haven't been built. And so you will see on here that we have the ones that have been built, the ones that haven't been built. And the problem that creates is that we have an issue with five-year housing land supply. And so in terms of convincing our politicians and our local population that we need yet more housing, you can imagine the task that that is. Because actually what people think is that we should build all those first. Unfortunately, that's not how the planning system works. You can allocate <laughs> and allocate, but it's all about the delivery, which we don't have a role in as planners. So there's, there's a difficulty there, but I wanted to show you this so that you understand when you're looking around the country or at Milton Keynes, that actually the permissions are given and we are working together to try and deliver them out. But we, it doesn't seem to matter how many houses you have in the system, you still need more at the moment. And so how are we doing that? Well, we're finally breaking the M1, hopefully. So what we're trying to do is fill up the urban area first. We're going to have um, three and a half thousand homes on brownfield sites and regeneration sites. So this is clearly where the government are at the moment. Going back to my original point about we're back to urban regeneration away from greenfield sites again, away from the green belt. You know, brownfield's the way forward. So we're going three and a half thousand on brownfield, one and a half thousand in the centre to try and build up the population in the centre. And then we're going to start looking along the routes of the expressway and the East West Rail. And so that's going to be after those decisions have been made. So in the South East Growth Area, that will be after the, express, uh, the East West Rail has been completed in that part. And over the motorway, then we're hoping that we will have a route for the expressway. <laughs> but also, um, we can release that site if some of those 19,725 homes aren't built quickly enough. Um, and so that's the pattern. We're slowly starting to move east. And that's the way we're going to be going because of the National Infrastructure Commission and the Futures Report. So this is probably where I get to do my soapbox bit about the current issues in planning. Um, and, and you get a bit of the Planning Officer Society President piece from me. Because in terms of Milton Keynes and what we can't do and why it's so difficult... Um, and wouldn't it be nice if it all works as it used to? The biggest thing for me is the forward funding of infrastructure. If I could forward fund infrastructure, then I think my sales pitch to the local community would be that much better. At the moment, I find it very hard to defend the current planning system in terms of how it works. 
um, when you look at how it worked for Milton Keynes right at the beginning, you can't argue against the fact that that was much better. And so when I'm trying to say that we need to develop, we need to have more, but it's not going to be quite as good, I could really do with the pooling restriction on community infrastructure level, levy in section 106 being released. I could do with being able to borrow and, and I could do with actually being able to get on and deliver in the way that we want to, so local flexibility. The original plan for Milton Keynes was about flexibility. So certain things were rigid, but everything else was flexible so it could adapt, and that's the way we need to think about it. In terms of making Milton Keynes a place for everybody, unfortunately Milton Keynes is becoming increasingly only a place for people who own a car. We find it really difficult to get public transport systems to work well in Milton Keynes. And so we really need to find something that it can get into the grid square, so we're looking at autonomous cars, shared vehicles, um, everything, to make sure that it isn't just a system for those who can afford it. We really need to sort that out. We need to look at the regeneration of those older areas. So we need to, again, um, be brave and have the discussion with some of the original designers who still are living in Milton Keynes, in some respects, about that we really do need to make sure that people have a, a good place to live, even if it was particularly special in architectural terms, and come to an agreement about what to retain and what to change, again, so that everybody has the same opportunities. The older town centre, so Bletchley, Wolverton, are really starting to struggle to remain successful. It's hard being next to Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes is a real magnet for for people to go to, and actually Bletchley and Wolverton, their, their retail offer is struggling, and we need to see how we can help them to retain a presence um, right next to what is probably the biggest of big brothers in terms of um, a centre. The pressure to, for homes to meet a growing population, I think that this comes back to the, how do we convince people that we can actually grow? because we do need to grow, our population is soaring. And how do you say to your politicians and local people that you need to allocate so many more houses so your yearly target goes up, but actually all that does is mean that your five-year land supply position gets much worse. And so whilst we're still in this situation where we have a five-year housing land target, we're always going to be in debt if we try and be aspirational. Um, I think that in areas like Milton Keynes, where there clearly is the aspiration to grow, then there should be some leeway in terms of the five-year housing land supply, or that it should be just what it is. If you've got 19,725, I've got it on the brain now, um, homes, then actually that's enough land supply. It's not a delivery test, it's a land supply test. And if you've got the land allocated, then it should remain as that. We need to consider how we fund our ageing population. Milton Keynes was once a very young place. <coughs> Clearly, not everywhere stays young forever. If Milton Keynes is 50, then it makes sense that those people arrive 50 years older, or they're getting older. Um, so there's, I, I think that there's, the current systems for supporting development do not look at the demographics so they don't appreciate that actually people are living longer and that the councils have to support more and more services um, and so in terms of what we expect from developments in terms of tariff or land value capture we have to consider much more than physical infrastructure in terms of what the 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 weight on the local area is we need to also in milton keynes find employment land um, employment land in Milton Keynes, as with retail at the beginning, was all dispersed. So to um, disperse the traffic. So the, you would have centres and zones for employment in different grid squares so that all the traffic wouldn't be going into the centre at the same time or to you know, the outskirts. That has changed because the M1 has become a real attractor for logistics and just distribution. And so you naturally get groupings around those transport hubs um, we also have very old employment areas in some of those grid squares, um, which actually may be better used for housing now 
but there is a resistance to move away from the, that original model of dispersal. And the impact on the road network, as much as the grid works, and it's very good, it is starting to get congested at peak times. And if we want to continue to, I suppose, support the grid system and how it operates, we have to make sure it continues to work. And that comes back to the, one of the first points, is that we have to find a different way for some people to travel. So I've done a bit of this, but I do think that that sort of sums it up for me, is that if I was writing to the minister and saying what I would like that would change Milton Keynes and enable us to do something really aspirational again, I think it would be the funding. It would be a return to strategic planning. Actually, whilst we still all plan for our own areas, we're no, never going to achieve something big. And that arc that we've all talked about between Oxford, Milton Keynes and Cambridge is never going to happen because, unfortunately, you can't build that sort of um, scale of development without working with people beyond your administrative boundaries. An appreciation that large strategic sites, the best way to plan is really a mixture of those great big sites and the very small ones, so that you've got a good flow of development. You can use the small and medium builders, but you can also engage in proper master planning. At the moment, we are penalised as a country for trying to do the right thing in terms of master planning. And so when we know that the infrastructure takes three to five years to put it in on a major site, and yet in that time, we're penalised because we're meant to be developing houses. And so the natural inclination across the country is just to build the houses as quickly as possible and leave the rest for later. And that's what creates the sort of problems that we've got in terms of our urban environment. We need more flexibility. Milton Keynes was all about flexibility and that's why it worked. It could adapt. And I believe there is a role, again, for a locally controlled development corporation because actually councils continuing to make decisions on a wide area in terms of spatial planning in the long term is not going to work when you have such short political cycles because actually everybody is interested in a three-year maximum term and therefore everything is limited to three years when actually we need to be thinking 20, 30, 50 years. And that a development corporation or a similar model would allow us to do that. Thank you. We were talking about speaker box all from Generation X. I've got a question about town centre growth. Mm. Before that, I've got a comment about strategic tariff and seal. Mm. I was working down in Ashford on the strategic tariff at the same time as Neil Keynes Partnership mm. worked on theirs. We were mm. swapping ideas and working close together. And we told government mm. all the benefits <laughs> and flexibility of having a strategic tariff. And they totally ignored us, and came up with a seal, <laughs> and they made the seal as complicated as possible, and as inflexible as possible. So you do tend to wonder what bloody hell government really wants to do. We are and talking to them again, so they're back being a bit interested. They're supposed to be ignoring you again. Yeah, well. Anyway, my, question, my question was, the, the central mill kings, the town centre, the retail bit, how was that planned for, and how did that work over the 50-year period? Because... So from day one, you couldn't have what you got there no. because you haven't got the population. So how did you, that grow without having empty sites? Or how were the empty sites treated so they didn't look like empty sites? Well, we still have empty sites. So that's the interesting part about it. Um, because the centre of Milton Keynes still has vacant sites that the Milton Keynes Development Partnership uh, are in charge of. And so um, it, it grew in terms of organically in terms of the market. And so there's definite zones in Milton Keynes, but they've been eroded over time by certain developments. Again, in the centre of Milton Keynes, there's some very unpopular urban design choices that have been made over recent years that wouldn't fit in with the original view. Um, and so the, the retail area, so the centre MK, is probably the most significant part. That Our retail centre, so our shopping centre, is listed. Um, and so I think that's, that's really important that people realise that we have a lot of listed modern heritage. And so this, the retail centre really is the, the, the piece that most people think of as being the, the jewel in the crown in terms of Milton Keynes. And the offices um, came 
as a, as a result, uh, again, like the residential of architects who came and designed individual buildings, and we've got some tremendous examples um, for businesses that were coming in, and eventually they filled. But at the moment, we have the same problem as most areas of office stock of this of this time, in that we have a lot of vacant stock that just simply isn't it isn't suitable for new incomers at the moment. But yeah, as to the question, I don't know exactly, but I think it was. It looks like it's been organic, and from what I know, it it's it's developed over time in zones. Before each site was developed, did it basically just look like another bit yeah. of a park or green yeah. structure? Well, it's it's, it's um, I mean, there's people in the room who'd know better than I actually. But there's um, there's at the moment the vacant sites are very much look like vacant sites. Um, in terms of how they blend in. I think that it doesn't look so stark as in other centres because of the low density. And so you don't, you don't notice the space that is vacant as much as you would in other urban areas. That's the interesting part, I think. Okay, thanks. Just coming on that, I grew up in North London, but I left when I was 18 and I haven't been there since. Um, <laughs> my parents didn't live there, so I'll go back now and again. Um, the Milton Keynes Shopping Centre, I don't know if anybody else knows Milton Keynes as well, but when I was a child, I vividly remember on a Sunday, my parents taking us there to walk through the shopping centre when it first opened, because it was a high street for the city, and, and that was where people just walked around. There were no shops open, but this was before Sunday trading. And then, after a couple of years, the owners decided to close the doors on a Sunday, and there was uproar in the, in the city, because... That was, a, that was a public space where people just promenaded on a Sunday and they couldn't do it anymore. As for your point about, uh, just a little bit trivial, it's mm. interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, as for your point about sites that are undeveloped, because of the nature of the grid road system, the point you made earlier, mm. Anna, about in fact, when you drive along the grid road, you don't actually you know what's it. happening. No. Because it, they're so well, particularly now, but they're all planted with. I don't know how many hundred yeah. thousands of trees. But after a while, you didn't know what was going on in the development areas because you couldn't see them. Or you were at a different level because the roads fit into the landscape. They follow the topography. So uh, you didn't feel like an abandoned city. In fact, you can still drive around it, I think, and think, you know, crikey, is there a housing site behind there? Because all you can see is trees. So it, it didn't ever give the impression mm. there was a lot of vacant land. And if it was vacant, you probably thought it was supposed to be vacant because it was green. So yeah. The low density, the low density in that does really help, yeah. yeah. Um, so you've talked about the change of design in uh, the expansion yeah. areas, such as with the high density yeah. and street design. So would you still consider these estates, such as Brooklands and Broughton, to still complement the original vision? And what would you say has been driving this change? Well, the, the driver for that change was governmental. So it was very much in the era where we had sustainable communities plans in local government and it was all about um, trying to be most efficient in terms of our urban planning. So at that time we had maximum parking standards, we had um, you know, all sorts of things that would control the amount of car use for instance and therefore the densities went up because actually the more ho homes you could fit on, obviously the more people you could house, but it's better for a public transport system. As to whether they lend themselves to the original design, I, I think in the eastern expansion area it's very different to the original design of Milton Keynes, um, and it's noticeably so. I don't, I don't know that I necessarily agree that it's a bad thing, but I think on the western expansion area, <laughs> quite different, because that's come along later, the stubs for the um, grid roads have gone back in, um, some of the development is starting to form more of a grid pattern. And so there's been a definite move to go back to what was originally intended, rather than on the east, where you've got something completely different. And I think in terms of the next plan, that we'd be definitely looking more to the prior to the eastern expansion area than we would to the eastern expansion area in terms of design, if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a can maker by background, so I'm, yeah, this is something that I'm really interested in. I think that there's room for all of the layers of plan. I think that a strategic plan is essential. Um, if you see the uh, sort of, the, I suppose, the 
inertia in plan making around the country at the moment at a local plan level. <laughs> it's because there's no direction. And so um, actually thinking about things over a much wider area starts to make the local make sense. And so imagine that you're thinking about, you've got the M1 in your area like we have. If you only take your two junctions of it, it is particularly hard to start to think about what impact there's going to be. And things like that, healthcare, you know, hospitals, um, where people travel to work, um, those sort of things can only be done on a much wider level than the local administrative boundary. However, there are things that can only really be done by the communities that live in them. And we've seen some really good examples of neighbourhood plans that have looked at what they want in the community. So the Newport Pagnell one I talked about. They've taken a real look at what they want. They've looked at the infrastructure that they're missing. They've looked at the development quantum that they would need in order to get that. And they have actively planned for it. Now, would we have done that? Possibly not, because as a local council, we don't necessarily know what that local community wants. And so there is a real role for neighborhood planning at the very local level but I, I believe you need the three tiers. I think you need a strategic plan. I think you need a local plan so that um, develop, you know, so committees know what decisions they're making. <laughs> you know, design criteria, how to do applications, all those sort of things. And then you need the neighbourhood plans, and that makes you a decent development plan as a whole. And they're not mutually exclusive, and so they all work together as different layers. Uh, um, just a quick curiosity. You mentioned the green space as one of the yeah. attractors of, of the community, one of the things that make it a place where people want to live, and then also the, the boulevards and the, the public yeah. spaces. Now, this is all very nice, but probably costs a lot of money to maintain all these things. So how, how, how did, is this done? Well, I think that the Parks Trust, who have most of the green, as I call it, um, was set up um, when the Development Corporation was abolished. So the, there's a community foundation in Milton Keynes and there's a Parks Trust. And they, they are the guardians, so one of the community um, um, reserve sites and facilities that we've got is the community foundation, and the other of the green spaces and open spaces. And they provide a maintenance model through funding from development and through asset management. So um, in terms of um, the Parks Trust, they obviously have assets that they've been granted in terms of some of the open spaces, and they can make decisions about how they use them commercially, and so they can raise that income. I think the grey space is the more interesting one because that's local government, and actually what we never predicted was the strangulation that has occurred <laughs> over the recent years. And so we <coughs> never expected that we would be so short of resources that we wouldn't be able to manage those, space, those places properly. And so if you walk through Milton Keynes at the moment, I quite often get you know, splashed by puddles under paving slabs, those sort of things. Irritating for me, but it also shows that there's a deterioration. You can see where granite sets have come off, marble frontages, you know, and actually the council cannot afford to do some of that work. In centre of Milton Keynes, they're looking at a bid model now, um, which with the amount of um, value you've got in some of the businesses that you've got in Milton Keynes and the shopping centres, Actually, a bid model, I think, could be really good. I've worked on bids elsewhere. And that means that the businesses, because they're complaining to the council about the public realm quality, can then start investing in some of the things that the council no longer able to do. And so we, we might begin to see, if that vote goes through, that, that some of the areas around the business sector and the retail sector start to be renewed. We're also working on that Renaissance CMK, which is about how can we work with the private sector to get the investment in the public realm, or that allows us to invest in the public realm again. Yeah, so it's a follow up on the on the neighbour planning question. Um, you know, obviously neighbour plans are part of the wider development plan. We're planning applications are determined. You know, that's that's one of the considerations along with the local plan, etc. And obviously, you, you talk about the importance of neighbour plans. Um, I'm just, just bearing in mind, I'm just, just wondering whether you want to just talk about maybe when they can come into conflict with the counts, particularly Milton Keynes, and think about the, the shopping... Oh, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> ...that's currently going on, where obviously Milton Keynes Town Council believe yeah. that develop and does not accord with, yep. with the neighbourhood plan. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, the inquiry's gone, but the, um, the inspector is yet to submit a report to the Secretary of State. 
Um, for those who aren't knowledgeable about this, there is a shopping centre in Milton Keynes that has a um, public open space or semi-public open space as defined by the <coughs> business neighbourhood plan running through in between the shops along the, uh, lo along the mo main grid road, um, sort of track. But it's inside, but it's the um, size of probably a dual <coughs> carriageway in terms of the space that's there. I think that's the best way to explain it. Um, the council um, made a decision that the shopping centre could redevelop um, and reduce the space to 15 metres from 22. Um, the decision was called in and there's been an inquiry. The facts are that in planning, the local authority is the decision maker. And so the neighbourhood plan has weight but it doesn't have the full weight, you have to take the development plan as a whole. And in terms of balance in planning, the reduction to 15 metres was not seen to be impacting on either the policy or on the public open space by the council. And so that was our position. Can't comment on the outcome, but you know that's, that's where we've been and we spent many days discussing it. So we do come into conflict, it's rare. I think that is the the one <laughs> where we've come into conflict but I also think it's important that just as the local plan shouldn't be the sole determiner when, determiner when you're looking at the development plan nor should the, nor should the neighbourhood plan neither is King, they have to work together Yes well, um, there's two hands it's just this, this is the penultimate question Okay, sorry uh, planners in certain parts of London with similar modernist planning see this as a huge opportunity versus other parts of the country and I'm just wondering if you feel the same way or whether there's just a different kind of growth scenario. Um, what, see the modernist me? planning as an opportunity versus other parts of the country which yeah. didn't have that. Oh absolutely, I mean Milton Keynes is um, really one big opportunity in terms of it has all of the creativity that was brought about by the talent that was in the development corporation at the beginning, you're not going to get that everywhere and we need to build on that. Um, but you also have the space to, available where you can do something again. And, and I think that's the difference between um, London and any other part of the country, is that Milton Keynes still has things to do. It's not taking down the old and building the new, you know, so it's not renewal. It's about doing something different as well. And I think that provides a real opportunity um, and I was saying just before that, um, you know, Milton Keynes has to be the best place to be a local authority planner, really. It's, it's got the best opportunities, you know, in terms of what you get to do and the, and the things that you get to see and deal with um, because of the amount of space and the original master plan. How are your smaller town centres performing and whether you've got any uh, approach or strategy to supporting them and strengthening their role? So in terms of, I, I mentioned that our town centres, our older ones are struggling. That's no different to most market towns around the country. Uh, uh, you know, retail's in a different place to, what, to which it was um, in terms of we all do everything on our phones online, don't we? Um, we we really walk around in the same way that we would have used to in terms of shopping. And, and our older towns suffer more from that than the Milton Keynes model. What we have got, so in one of the um, older towns, Wolverton, they have a neighbourhood plan covering their economic centre. So they have a strong view of how you could regenerate that area and you could make um, Wolverton much better. Um, and Bletchley, we're looking at a master plan for Bletchley in terms of helping to get enough commerciality in there to start creating a footfall that will create a customer base for, that, for a renewed centre. So there's all sorts of different models in terms of the older centres that we're looking at, but actually the, the I suppose Milton Keynes being successful allows us to do that um, in a way that in some areas it's very difficult if you haven't got the success to build on where, where you go in, you're starting from scratch. That's good. Okay. I'm aware that there, there are there are people who would like to ask questions, but I'm going to draw uh, this part of the evening to a close at this point. There's an opportunity for those of you who want to follow up things with Anna over a glass of wine, but bear in mind she's off duty now, so be gentle with her. Um, can I, um, 
can I grab the audience for a great set of questions for Braving Stone Doris this evening yeah. and made it here. Uh, but above all, can I say thank you very much to Anna for an excellent presentation, um, full of insights. Um, and I think, you know, I think we probably all agree that Milton Keynes, uh, the planning of Milton Keynes is in very good hands, uh, so long as they've got Anna. So can we show our appreciation? Really?